blacks and bees Dapples and greys Coach and sexy from Miss Jenny Brown, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, for my prettiest little friend, anything. Oh, come on, Julie. The last time you told her that, she hit you up for a loan. Yeah. That was a nice thing to do, thanks. Can you mingle with your fans for a while? Mingle with your fans? If there's any mingling, counselor. We just took a five-day skiing trip. We didn't mingle. Jenny, did we mingle or did we not? When you made me take all those naps, you mingled. <laughs> all right, that's enough, Shorty. <laughs> and I would really love to. But there's this man I've been seeing, and since this is closing night, we sort of promised each other. <laughs> of course, of course, we understand. Why don't you call me next week, Julie? Sure. Uh, unless you're going to go and elope or something. I mean, you're not, are you? I mean, this isn't serious, is it? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, okay. Call me next week, okay? Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. I need some time to think. I am so tired from all of these nightclub gigs and traveling from city to city. Which is exactly what we're remedying right now. My old hideaway here is now your new hideaway, to which even I don't come unless invited. There's a rental car outside, so you can come and go as you please. Stay here as long as it takes, Julie. I don't care. I guess I have been on that old showbiz merry-go-round for so long. It's just hard for me to settle down. And what you're not used to can scare you. Well, anything scares you around here, pretty lady. There's an old revolver in the bedside drawer. Oh, come on. You know what I meant. And what about your father? Are you going to tell me that Lloyd Wesley Jordan doesn't already think that I'm trying to promote his son for a piece of the family treasury? Well, considering he was nailed by Alicia. Oh. That's true. Mom died, and 15 minutes later, the old man was married again to that bombshell. I now have a father who can claim the fifth largest maritime fleet in the entire world, mm -hmm. and a stepmother who posed for nudie calendars. I now have a father who can claim the fifth largest maritime fleet in the entire world, and a stepmother who posed for nudie calendars. That was at the cabin? Yes, sir. You took us straight there from the club, just like you figured. So I had the place bugged already. Kirk? Your past investigations on my behalf have always been thorough and prompt. If I had engaged you prior to my remarriage, I would... Well, suffice it to say, I don't wish my son to repeat my mistake. So you will continue to dig into the past of this Julie Heller and find me some ammunition with which to buy her off. Or frighten her off. As the case may be. We'll be staying on the yacht this month. You have the number? Yes, sir. Bye, Kirk. Excuse me. Oh, Leo, come on in. It's all right. Now, James, we did it. Irrevocable options on all three freighters. And we're going to get them at the cross-collateralized package figure. Take a look. Yes. That's fine negotiating, Leo. Fine negotiating, as usual. However, I've decided against a capital expenditure at this time. Are you serious? We have some shareholders who want an increase in dividends this year. LJ, we need these freighters. Besides that, you've had me on this day and night for three months. I'm sorry about all the good effort. Hold it, hold it. It's not a question of my efforts. 
You're talking about the future of the company. I understand. Why don't you have dinner with us tomorrow? Paul will be joining us, and the three of us can kick it around, okay? I think Leo's right. Either we start thinking three, four years in advance right now, or we wind up behind. You know that those cruise ships are nothing but ancient tankers and freighters that have been refurbished? They're tired and they're old and they simply have got to be replaced. They all look so new and pretty. It's cosmetic, so they should not function. Paint jobs don't cover metal fatigue or worn-out design. Why the blazes doesn't he just simply step down and let you take over? While there still is something to take over. I'm sorry, Alicia. I should not have said that. Certainly not a friend of you. Don't pay any attention to me, goodness sakes. <laughs> all of this is way beyond me anyway. Like hell it is. Ooh, Paul, mustn't be techy with his stepmother. Now, tell me, boys, just how important is the acquisition of these freighters? Are you sure, Kirk? You must be sure. Will be as soon as I hear from Philadelphia. And if what I've got is confirmed by Philly, what you got is no more problems with your son and that chick. When you confirm it, you contact me immediately. Yes, sir. It's a rule that I've made. Once I bring him his midnight brandy, it's sleepy by time, no matter what. That's the only way I get him to stop working. Miss Heller? Oh, sir, Mr. Jordan has requested a word with Miss Heller in his study. Thank you, Felix. I missed you last night. I'm sorry, sir. Your father said just Miss Heller. Miss Heller, I won't prolong this or can decode it for your convenience. Now, this is a one-way plane ticket to New York. The flight leaves 8 o'clock in the morning. And this is my certified check for $10,000. No strings attached. However, should you see my son again, I will ruin you completely. A private detective in my employ has made that possible, so now... Good night, Miss Ella, and goodbye. Now, wait just a moment, Mr. Jordan. Your flight leaves 8 in the morning. You will be on it. You go to hell! Julie! Uh, don't call. Please don't talk to me now. Just leave me alone. Julie, what happened? I just slapped your father in the face, and I swear if I ever see him again, I'll kill him. Paul! Believe me, she's much too upset now. You're only going to make it worse. She needs to be alone now. Just how would you know that? I know that. Trust me. I'll call her tomorrow. sleep again in there with the door locked. Julie Heller? Yes? Uh, you're under arrest, Miss Heller, for the murder of Lloyd Wesley Jordan. For the murder of? Lloyd Wesley Jordan.
picture made the front page. I thought I'd drop by and see if you needed a toothbrush. You could use a hacksaw. We got one of those. Good defense will do as much as a hacksaw. You got one of those? I'm real glad you came by, Eddie. You know, the DA's case, isn't that terrific? He did threaten to kill Jordan in front of witnesses, but their vested interest in the victim could make them a tactical for bias. Biggies are being nailed at the airport. The DA figures that being apprehended while fleeing is a tacit admission of guilt. But even that you get beat if you've got an alibi that holds. Do you? Look, Eddie, I don't have um, any money for a high-powered attorney. That wasn't the question. Do you have an alibi for midnight last night? I was asleep in bed. You were too upset to be asleep by that hour. I took a pill. What kind? What color? Who prescribed it? What? What was the doctor's name? You got the bottle? Wait a minute. Hold on just a minute. What do you want? What are you doing here, anyway? Jenny loved your singing. Also, you're my responsibility. It's the only way I could get him to agree to bail. It's okay. You'll stay with Lacey and Jenny. Look, Eddie, I, uh... I don't have any money for bail. Paul Jordan's putting up your bond right now. I don't want to see him. Okay, so you didn't take any sleeping pills. Or even if you did, it wouldn't have worked that fast. You left the Jordan yard about 10.30, right? Yes. That's almost an hour's drive from where you said you were staying. So even if you did get home at 11.30 in the shape you were in, that pill would not have put you out by midnight. I was in bed asleep. Was Paul with you? No, it wasn't that kind of an arrangement. Paul wants to... Paul did want to marry me. I wasn't so sure, so we decided to take things slowly until... See how things worked out. Did you kill his father? I was in bed asleep. A jury won't believe that any more than I do. Then why don't you just go? Because you checked into the airline counter under your own name. Escaping murderers don't usually do that. They figure they've got time, that the body won't be found for a while. So I don't think you did kill him. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Get in. <laughs> Julie squared away, right? Yeah, well, she may wish she never had left jail. She wasn't in the apartment ten seconds before Jenny hit her up for guitar lessons. You've already shopped yourself in the bankruptcy. How are you going to buy her a guitar before 1987? Well, you remember that knockout bikini you wanted to buy me? I mean, for your own selfish, obscene reasons, of course. Mm, until I saw the price. Until I saw the price and wouldn't let you buy it for me. Oh, I see. So with the money you saved me by not letting me... Right. Look, honey, why don't you let me buy the guitar? Oh, you sweet-talking thing, you. Well, that's nice to hear from two of my employees in the middle of my working day with their dinner cooking on the desk. JJ, how you doing? I think it's done. Uh, 30 seconds. What are you doing with the Jordan file? The man's deceased. I've got his policies to review, accountings and shareholdings to correlate. Did you know, JJ, that even if the current Mrs. Lloyd Wesley Jordan were cut out of his will, she'd still get a minimum of five million in corporate stock? Wait a minute. Suddenly dawning on me is a very unfortunate thought. You're not by any chance planning to represent little Miss What's her name to holding down to police station for his murder. Her name is Julie Heller. Eddie, we did some legal work for that man. Now, chances are very good that the Jordan Enterprises are going to retain this firm to settle his estate. That's conflict of interest. Not if you turn down the job. Turn down one of the biggest clients who... J.J., the girl didn't kill him. Now, what's more important, her whole life and future are making you a few more bucks to blow at the track. Don't answer that, because I don't want to lose the great fondness that I feel for you at this moment. Why do I feel that fondness? Because not once have you asked me what this is. What is that? This is the Freelander case. Same type hot plate, same type styling brush. That's why they never found a knife. And that's why your eyewitness won't be discredited for claiming that the blade he saw looked black. Congratulations, JJ. You won yourself a case. Your client's home free. Uh, excuse me. Uh, a used guitar. Good, but used. Eddie.
you relentless bloodhound. Speak to me, will you? Can we get away from the police building first? So I was hanging around the homicide department like you told me to. And anyway, some fella came in, said he was waiting around to give a statement about the young lady whose picture was in the paper. So you thought quickly, improvised something ingenious, and, uh... I, I just walked up to him and told him I needed his name and address. I mean, I didn't actually represent myself as being a police officer or anything. Wilbur Epstein. That's his name and address, and that's the service station where he works. Harvey, you're terrific. I want to be a lawyer, not a con artist. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. Now, Julie Heller left a rented car at the airport when she was arrested. I want you to find out what kind of mileage she put on it. Right. How do I do that? I'm going to drop you at the car rental agency. How do I get them to show me the records? Grab the wheel. You, uh, you make a private contribution to a needy employee. Oh, no. Mr. Capper, I'm not good at stuff like Bobby, this. don't worry. You're going to be superb. Well, where will you be if I need a lawyer? Come on, now. You know you couldn't afford me. Well, thanks for having me aboard and for talking to me, Mrs. Jordan. Paul said that you were a very nice person and that you'd be respectful in everything. I wish Julie would at least talk to me. I can't figure what she and Dad could have argued about like that. She must have told you something. Whatever she may have told me has to remain privileged communication between attorney and client. I'm sorry. But what I can tell you is that the police report indicated Julie's airline ticket was purchased the day before with one of your father's credit cards. Are you telling me my dad was trying to send her away? That's what they were arguing about? I'm only telling you something you could read for yourself in the record. Alicia, if dad was trying to bust us up, he would have told you about it beforehand. Me? Oh, Paul, you know that I've never mixed in with any of your father's business deals. I know you would have either wielded it out of him or out of that butler of his that you've rewarded from time to time for services rendered. How about it? Paul. Why would I tell you something that I know is only going to hurt you? And you sure don't think that I could have stopped your father from doing it, for goodness sake. But you stopped me from following Julie afterward. And that was more than feminine commiseration, wasn't it? You even stopped me from trying to undo his damage. Why? Because I didn't want that two-bit brought around here any more than he did. Wait a minute. Let's calm down here. You butt out! Why did you want her out? What harm would it do you for me to finally find somebody? What harm? I am mourning your father, even if you are not. And that's the news for this early evening in Los Angeles. See you again at 11 o'clock with updates on all the late-breaking stories, sports results, and the weather. Five minutes to lasagna, ladies. But Julie said we could practice after the news. Let's see if you remember how to tune it. I'll hold it just a lot. Yeah. Okay. Now, fifth fret. Okay. Two, see where the dot is? Yeah. Good. Okay. I want to make sure that um, Eddie's uncorking the good stuff. <laughs> That's good. Now, tilt it just a little farther this way. That's good. That's great. You've got it. Food in five. Eddie? What's the matter? I don't know. Yes, I do. First, she went through every morning paper, every evening paper, every TV news program on every channel. Second, she never said a word about picking up the rest of her stuff, not even to change her clothes. Well, I offered again to lend her my car. I just thought it would be simpler if I picked up a few things around here. Oh, we're not allowed back in there until after she has the thing tuned perfectly for us. Oh, boy, are you a pushover. Excuse me, folks, I have a daughter to alienate. You know, uh, at the risk of beating the song to death, if I don't know something, I can't defend you against it in open court. Now, you're going to have to tell me where you were at the time Lloyd Jordan was killed. I told you. I was in bed asleep around midnight. Oh, yeah? 
Now, you listen to me. First, there was a certain Wilbur Epstein who has already sworn you stopped for gas at his station at approximately 2.30 that morning. Second, in a 24-hour period, you put over 200 miles on that rented car, which means that you could have easily driven back and forth from the Jordan yacht several times that night. I didn't. Then what did you do? Look, Eddie, I have an alibi. And if somehow they find me guilty, then I will tell you what it is. And I swear the conviction will not hold up in court. But unless that happens, I cannot tell you. So help me, Julie. If you don't level with me right here and now, I'm going to drop kick you and your case right out that door. And I do mean right now. What's going on here? It's not a game, Lacey. And I don't think Jenny should count on any more guitar lessons from Julie Heller. Well, where is she going? What do you mean? Well, she ran in, she borrowed my car keys, and she ran out again. time move by move detail by detail tell me exactly what happened just let it flow well uh after my argument with jordan on the yacht i drove back here i really did take a sleeping pill but just like you figured i was too upset i just uh, laid there staring at the ceiling trying to understand what had made me get so blindly furious at what Jordan had done. And then it dawned on me that I really had fallen in love with his son, with Paul. I really conked out, I guess, because the next thing I knew, there was a noise. I thought it was just the clock chiming, but then I realized that there was also somebody banging on the front door. I thought it must be Paul, that he'd follow me from the yacht and that we could talk, and I could tell him what had happened and how I felt. It was a man's voice I didn't recognize. I asked if it was Paul, but he just banged on the door again, hard. It scared me. I remembered Paul telling me there was a revolver in the bedside table. I felt a little foolish about getting it, but he was pounding on the door so hard. Julie! Then whoever it was began calling me by name. I felt a little better. At least I knew it wasn't some random junkie or a prowler. He said his name was Kirk, Barney Kirk, that he was a private investigator hired by Lloyd Jordan. He was abusive and insulting, and he knew things about me. A couple of juvenile arrests, a child I had given up for adoption back in Philadelphia. What oh, no, no, honey, want? no, I got you paid you... for just exactly what you are. And now that I got proof for him, Mr. Jordan doesn't have to bribe you to get you out of town. So, uh, where's the ticket and the check he gave you? 
I am. I don't know. I, I forgot where. I, what are you doing here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So now, uh, you wouldn't want that sweetie pie of yours, uh, Paul, to find out that you had an illegitimate kid, would you? Or that you had him taken away? Or that you got an old rap sheet in Philly that says you are a bum? I had my child when I was 16 years old. She went to a good home. They didn't take that kid away from you until you were 21, when they gave you six months in a slammer. Now, the airplane ride is on us. But Mr. Jordan wouldn't want to get cheated out of uh, 10 grand. I don't want his lousy money. I just want... I know exactly what you want. You know what turns my stomach? If some lousy street broad who is trying to make a big score for herself, you will be on that plane, you bum! He looked almost happy that I'd slapped him back. He threw me down, and then he came at me. I thought he was going to kill me. I saw the gun there, and I just... I... I went into a sort of vague, fog-bound panic. I drew some clothes into a suitcase and not even knowing why. I just was so horrified. I had to get away. So I drove and I drove, and I think I stopped once to get some gasoline. But all I could think of was that Paul was going to find out about me. That he was going to know that I was in jail and that I lost my own child because of it. And then he was going to look at me with disgust. And I, I couldn't bear it, so I had to get as far away as I could from Paul. Not from what happened. Paul. So you drove to the airport? <laughs> yeah. You got an alibi out, right? You couldn't have been on the yacht at midnight murdering Jordan because at midnight you were right here killing someone else. Terrific. It was self-defense, Eddie, I swear. Well, how do we prove that to a jury? Kirk had something he was using against you, so he had a motive for killing him as well as Jordan. <laughs> that was absurd. I can only defend myself against a murder charge if I confess to another one. Do you believe me? I believe the few little bloodstains I see here and there, but other than that, no corpse, no weapon, no nothing. Is this why you were checking the news media so hard, waiting for the body to be discovered up here? Yes. Julie, what did you go to jail for when you were 21? This guy I was involved with was receiving stolen property. I let him keep some of it at my house. You know, I never once thought of my daughter. I never once thought what it might mean for her life. You know, Kirk, he didn't call me any names that I haven't called myself a thousand times before. So, what do you think of me now, Eddie? I think we both better concentrate on one thing before this goes any further. I think we better make peace with Lacey for blowing her lasagna. Yeah. Barty Kirk, right, a private investigator. Now, the best way to get an inside rundown is to find some other private investigator who'll fake on him. Uh-huh. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got it. Right. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Lacey, Mr. Capper wants you to get me some bribe money out of petty cash. Harvey, there's certain subtleties of language, Harvey. What about the girls before Julie that your father intervened with? They weren't in the same ballpark with Julie. Oh, well, then he had butted in on your personal life before. Well, how come you were so surprised to find out he had tried it with Julie? Meaning what? Just ask him. You know who I'd really like to talk? Leo Saunders. Leo's up in the office. I told him he could talk to you freely. He won't need me with you. Mr. Jordan. I'm going to see Julie. Where were you when your father was killed? Right there on the yacht, asleep. 
And yes, Mr. Kepper, I could easily have killed my father. Very easily. The king is dead. Long live the king. It's true, you know. If LJ hadn't died, we wouldn't be buying those three freighters now, and Paul would still be only the heir presumptive. Where were we, darling? Ah, oh, still on redesigned superstructure number one cargo hold. I think you're going to call Mr. Hendricks on that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mavis, do me a favor. Go get some coffee, okay? <laughs> Sir, would you like some coffee? Ah, uh, no thanks. Thank you. Mm. A shorthand ain't a bad either. Any further questions, Mr. Kappa? Oh, yeah. Uh, they say that uh, you and Paul get along pretty well. Yeah, we get along very well. Are you defending that gal or prosecuting the rest of us? Maybe a little of each. I don't think I like you, Mr. Kappa. If you have any other questions, ask them. The garage attendant near your apartment building says you didn't come home the night of the murder. Or any night since then. I've been staying at a high-rise motel near the freighter docks to facilitate meetings with maritime officials, contractors, etc., etc. You know, that's something I can't quite figure out. The freighter deal wasn't going through the day Lloyd Jordan died, but on that same day, you were continuing right along with it as though... We were hoping that L.J. would see the light, come to his senses. We? Let me tell you something. It may not seem that way, but I'm a rather busy man. I'll give you one more question. As I understand it, the widow now has the voting rights in her deceased husband's stock. You also have a considerable block of shares. That's not a question. Paul Jordan could be appointed president of Jordan Enterprises only by his father. But since his father died before appointing him, well, now it sounds to me like you've got a vote coming up. It's a mere formality. Not if you and the bereaved widow pooled resources and voted for you instead of for Paul. Mr. Capra, I think it is time for you to take a walk. Thanks. Herman Wall, Assistant District Attorney. And you are going to level with me, boy. Yes. Yes, sir. <clears throat> sir, now, I did not actually represent myself as being a police officer. That I absolutely do swear to. Conversely, I do realize I did say to the man that we needed to have his name and address, which use of the word we could, I understand, be interpreted by him as, as implying that, that I was indeed a police officer. However, if, if you just let me go just this one time. I take it you're confessing. I'm just glad it's over. So am I, because I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Now, what I'm talking about is the interest you've been displaying around town in a private investigator named Barney Kirk. I understand you inquired about his record downtown. Oh, well, yes, sir. Well, you see, I heard he had his license suspended one time after a client filed an assault charge, and I was just here to verify that. What I want to know, Sonny, is why you're interested at all. Oh, Herman, you're crafty. You really are. It worked. You found a way to make me hot put it down here with the speed of light. Well, now you can pick on somebody your own size. Go home, Harvey. Use it, Harvey. And you, Fast Eddie, are going to give me the name of the client who's got you boys inquiring about Barney Kirk. Oh, terrific. Uh, you found this Barney, then? Who did it, Capra? Gee, now that's something I just couldn't tell you. What was he found? Gee, now that's something I just couldn't tell you. But you're welcome to come along and have a look at the remains. Mr. Capra, the corpse. <laughs> Kirk, I represent Julie Heller, the woman who shot you. If you'll just confirm to Mr. Wall where and when that happened. A woman? 
What woman is that? For refusing to give us word one about how he happened to receive his gunshot wound, Mr. Kirk here is about to be leaned on for obstructing justice, withholding evidence, and maybe even for bleeding in a public place without a license. I haven't decided yet. Give me a minute alone with him, will you, Herman? So how are you doing? You've been reading the papers, huh? Well, not till this morning. The bullet glanced off the rib, it got stuck in a fat. I know it doesn't sound like much, but, uh, I mean, they had me so high, man. I... Fine. You can show all of us your uh, scar as soon as you and I get done with business. It is going to be business, right? Well, I'll tell you, according to what I read in the paper, that girl's going to be in a lot of trouble without me as her alibi. And you're going to be in a lot of trouble the minute you cash the $10,000 check she got from Jordan. Oh, now, wait a minute. I didn't say I didn't meet the girl. The girl who will probably sign a criminal complaint against you for assault and file a civil suit for assault and battery, and you've already got one suspension of your license for the very same offense. Oh, <laughs> take it easy. Yeah, I get your point. But you can't blame a guy for trying, huh? Well, you got the murder rap dropped against your pretty little client. She and the private detective have agreed not to press charges against each other, so how about helping us with one or two of these paying clients? J.J., there's still the question of who did murder Lloyd Jordan. Your client's off the hook. That's that. You're a lawyer, not a detective. J.J., it's just a matter of time. Besides, I already know who did it. It's just a question of proof. Hang in there, will you? Let's see. The butler came back aboard with a fresh bottle of brandy just before Mrs. Jordan called him to unlock the door of the study. Lacey, pick up his statement from that point, will you? Okay. I came aboard amidships, carried the brandy directly to the bar so Mrs. Jordan might have it there when she wanted to pour Mr. Jordan's usual nightcap. Then back to my own quarters. I was just thumbing through the newspaper when I heard Mrs. Jordan's call for me. I went forward to the study door, unlocked it, and we discovered Mr. Jordan's body. Mrs. Jordan's scream brought Mr. Paul from his stateroom. She was severely shaken, of course. He put a sweater around her, and we both helped her down back to the master stateroom. After that... After that what? I allow this, Mr. Capper, because Julie asked me to. But this is hardly the propitious moment. And one half hour, Jordan Enterprises will be electing its new president in this room. And let's not be late with that, for goodness sake. Don't let us interrupt, by the way. What is this, anyway? We haven't got time for this now, you know. Uh, Lacey, there should be a man outside named Barney Kirk. Show him in, will you? Barney Kirk? I think he's got a report we should all hear. Now, for goodness sake. Well, maybe you'd prefer to start voting with and for each other before discovering who's a murderer and who isn't. Barney Kirk. What have you got, Barney? No, look, I'll tell you what. Why don't you go ahead and read it for us? Uh, Sweetheart, I'll pull up a chair for Mr. Kirk. Thanks. Uh, it's uh, basically just a statement. From someone at that high-rise motel you mentioned. He will swear that Mr. Leo Sunderson came into the bar not more than uh, ten minutes after midnight, looking like he'd been through a ringer. And he ordered three straight shots in a row. Who were you just before 12, Mr. Sunderson? Up in my hotel room. No, sir. Another statement. Night clerk. He saw you come through the front door and head straight for the bar a few minutes after midnight. I didn't kill him. I didn't! I don't think you did either. What do you think, Paul? Well, why ask me? Because you're a liar. Eddie. You were almost as upset as Julie that night. Yet you told me you were fast asleep when Mrs. Jordan screamed. According to the butler, you were not only still awake, you were still dressed. He said you put your sweater around Mrs. Jordan's shoulders when the body was discovered. And I asked myself, why would you lie about that? Either you were the murderer, or you were trying to protect Julie. And then I wondered, how could your being awake hurt Julie's case? Only if by being awake, you saw or heard something which made you know that none of the others could have done it. Paul, what did you see or hear that night? I heard Alicia and Leo arguing. Uh, show us on the floor plan. I was in my stateroom here. I could hear Felix cleaning up in the dining salon. Then Alicia coming in, telling Felix to go ashore to get some brandy. 
Felix said we had plenty of brandy, but she insisted he go anyway. Paul, I didn't know you were an eavesdropper. She and Leo argued. See, she wanted to help Leo get the company presidency, and she wanted Leo for herself. <laughs> That's absurd. <laughs> Shut up, Paul. You see, Mr. Capra, she didn't have the votes then. She uh, had already influenced Dad against my takeover, and... I am not going to be defamed by a punk like you! Elisha, please sit down. What was Leo's response? In a nutshell, I gave her a rather emphatic no thank you. On both counts. You heard Leo go, then? That's right. A couple minutes later, I heard Alicia in the bar. Then her footsteps walking past my stateroom toward Dad's study. She uh, called Felix. They found Dad, and she screamed. You knew the murderer couldn't be Leo or Alicia. So you thought it was Julie, didn't you? You thought I killed him, and you still wanted me? How's that for irony? Alicia and I don't mention the fact that we had the argument. And you don't tell us that you heard it. Especially after Kirk here proved that Julie was miles away at midnight. He realized that he himself would be the only principal suspect left. That is why you never admitted any of this until now, isn't it? Paul? Don't worry. Paul's statement only has one entrance. He never could have gotten around to his father's study, let alone back at Ken without being seen. Well, then who else could have been there around midnight? You tell him, Mr. Kirk. What, are you crazy? Me? She knows where I was. I sure couldn't be in two places at the same time, now could I? Oh, yes, he could. And I'll tell you how you managed it. You got the proof about Julie's past from Philadelphia, and you brought it straight to the yacht. It was close to midnight. These two were arguing. Paul was in his stateroom. Felix was assured. Now, it's my guess you try to hold up Mr. Jordan for more money. You are crazy. I brought him the goods on the broad... I called him. No! No, you did bring it. And you've got a history of violence, so you knew the cops might check your whereabouts when Jordan was found. You needed an alibi, and you thought of Julie. <laughs> You didn't have to break in. Just wait till she'd fallen asleep. Then use the key that Jordan had given you to bug the place before Julie even arrived. It had to be nearly 1 a.m. by then. You went inside, you were quiet, and you knew just what you had to do. You went to the grandfather clock, moved the hands back, then into the bedroom for the clock radio. You were even smart enough to think of Julie's wristwatch. By then, the pill had taken effect, and she was in a deep sleep. You went back outside, waited there till the clocks inside struck midnight, again. Actually, it was probably about one o'clock. Very cute little plan. Really? You'd wake her up, she'd think it was only midnight. You figured you'd taunt her, make her mad. Mad enough to give you the excuse you wanted, to get physical, hopefully to knock her unconscious. But here's where it went wrong. You hadn't planned on her shooting you. You had planned to knock her out. Then you'd set the clocks forward again to the correct time, and when Julie regained consciousness, she'd believe she'd been out cold since midnight, thus providing you with your alibi for that hour. But it turned out to be you who woke up later with a bullet in your ribs. You had the presence of mind to reset the clocks, all right. But Julie had taken a wristwatch with her. You couldn't reset that. Her watch was still an hour slow. That's why when she got to the airport, she found that her flight had already left. You've got a pretty good imagination, buddy. When you went to the cabin that night, you told Julie that Jordan wanted his $10,000 back. You couldn't have known he'd given it to her unless you'd seen him after he did it. Finally, my friend, those little bloodstains in the cabin, they don't lead straight out the door. They're in various interesting places around the floor, at the grandfather clock and at the electric clock on the little end table in the bedroom. Any questions? No? In that case, Lacey, how about calling a cop?
It's hot, it's cool, it's the new summer series that has critics from coast to coast raving. Want to know what all the excitement's about? Get ready for Northern Exposure, next on CBS.